chapter 58. Excuse me, sir, but a young lady. Where? He gestured back toward the gate. I was staring on a coat. A very beautiful young lady, a foreigner. She, but I was already past him and running down the corridor. I called back to his grinning face, to false, to make him turn out the light. Then I leaped down the stairs, raced out of the building, and along the path toward the gate. There was a bare bulb above Barba Vasily's window, a pool of white light. I expected to see her standing in it, but there was no one. The gate was locked at that time of night, since we masters all had pass keys. I felt in my pockets, and remembered that I had left mine in the old jacket I wore in class. I looked through the bars. There was no one in the road, no one on the thistly wasteland that ran down to the sea fifty yards away, no one by the water. I called in a low voice, but no quick shape appeared from behind the walls. I turned exasperatedly. Barba Vasily was hobbling slowly down through the trees from the master's block. Isn't she there? He seemed to take ages to unlock the side gate used in the evening. We went out into the road. The old man pointed away from the village. That way? I think. I began to smell more games. There was something in the old man's smile, the thundery air, the deserted road, and yet I didn't care what happened, as long as something happened. May I have your key, Barba? But he wouldn't let me have the one in his hand. Had to return inside his lodge and rummage to find another. He seemed to be delaying me, and when at last turned round with a spare key, I snatched it out of his hand. I walked quickly down the road away from the village. To the east, lightning shuddered. After seventy or eighty yards, the school wall turned inland at right angles. I thought Julie might be waiting round the corner of it. She wasn't. The road did not go much more than a quarter of a mile farther. Beyond the wall, it looped a little away from the sea to cross a dried-out torrent. There was a small bridge, and a hundred yards to the left and inland of that, another of the countless island chapels linked to the road by an avenue of tall cypresses. The moon was completely obscured by a dense veil of high cloud. But there was a gray, palmeresque light over the landscape. I came to the bridge and hesitated, torn between following the road and turning back toward the village, the much more plausible way for her to have gone. Then I heard her call my name. The voice came from the avenue of cypresses. I walked quickly up between them. Halfway to the chapel there was a movement to my left. She was standing ten feet away, hidden from the road, between two of the largest trees, a dark summer mackintosh, a headscarf, trousers, a seemingly black shirt, the paler oval of her face. In spite of what I first said, I knew at once. There was something about the way she waited, with her hands in her Macintosh pockets. Julie? It's me, June. Thank God you've come. I went close to her. Where's Julie? She looked at me a long moment, then let her head sink. I thought you'd realized. Realized what? What's going on? She met my eyes. Between her and Maurice, I left the silence and she looked down again. What the hell do you all take me for? She said nothing. You seem to have forgotten I've been through the rich man's mistress farce already. She shook her head. I didn't mean that. Just that she'll do whatever he asks in other ways. Her head remained down and I had my choice then. I should have turned straight on my heel and walked back to the school, my room, my desk, my examination marking, because I knew I had returned to the beginning as regards the mask. In terms of hard fact, I knew no more of this girl than when I had first set eyes on her naked figure running in the night below the terrace at Barani. Yet I also knew that I could no more turn on my heel than a dropped stone can fly back into the hand. And what exactly are you doing here? I don't think it's fair any more. What isn't fair? She glanced up at me. It was all planned. Her being snatched away from you like that? She knew all along it would happen. And this isn't planned? She stared resignedly beyond me into the night. I don't blame you for supposing it is. You haven't told me where Julie is. In Athens. With Maurice. 
From where you've just come? She nodded. Why this extraordinary hour? I didn't get here till dusk. I searched her expression. It contrived with her stance, an air of hurt innocence, of reproach at my suspicion. She was transparently playing a part. Why didn't you wait at the gate? I panicked. He was gone such a long time. Lightning flickered again. There was a waft of air, the smell of coming rain, and an almost continuous and increasingly ominous rumble from the east. What's there to panic about? I've run away, Nicholas. They must have guessed where. Why didn't you go to the police, the embassy? It's not a criminal offense, making someone fall in love with you under false pretenses. And she is my sister, she added. It's not what Maurice is doing, but what Julie is. There were telltale little pauses between the sentences, as if she had to have each one swallowed by me before she could go on. I did not leave her with my eyes. In the darkness, she looked hallucinatorially like her sister. She said, I've only come to warn you, that's all, and console me. She was saved from answering by the sound of a low voice from the road. We both looked round the cypress. Three dim shapes, men, were pacing slowly down it toward the bridge, talking in Greek. People, villagers, masters, often strolled to the end of the road and back in the evening for the coolness. June gave me what was meant to be a frightened look. That also did not convince me. You came on the noon boat? But she avoided the trap. I found a way by land, by Kranidi. Occasionally, philosophic parents used that route. It meant changing at Corinth and taking a taxi from Kranidi and then hiring a boat to bring one across from the mainland, a full day's journey, and difficult if you didn't speak reasonable Greek. Why? Because Maurice has spies everywhere here, in the village. I'll believe that part of it. I looked down again toward the road. The three men were strolling calmly on past the avenue of trees, their backs to us, the grayish strip of road, the black scrub beyond, the dark sea. They were plainly exactly what they seemed. I said, look, I'm getting bloody tired of this. Game's okay, but not with people's emotions. Perhaps I feel exactly the same. Once too often? Sorry, it won't wash. She said in a low voice, She really has fooled you, hasn't she? A good deal more convincingly than you have, and we've also been through this conversation before, so come on, where is she? At this moment, probably in bed with her real lover. I drew a breath. Maurice? The man you know as Joe. I laughed. It was too much. She said, all right, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to do a damn sight better than this, or I'm going back to my room. She was silent. I suppose that's why he stands and watches us making love together. You can do that if you're really making love to someone every night, if you knew the other man is only being made a fool of. She was far too persistent. It was like trying to sell a pig in a poke twice over to the same customer. This is getting sick. I've had enough. I turned to go, but she caught my arm. Nicholas, please, apart from anything else, I don't know where to spend tonight. I can't go to the house in the village. Try the hotel. She swallowed that rebuff, then tried again. They'll probably be here tomorrow, and if I'm going to be accused of anything, I'd like you beside me to back me up. That's all. Honestly. Just for a moment, there was a more authentic tone in her voice, and she had finally a little smile, a nice mixture of ruefulness and appeal for protection. I made my voice a shade gentler. You shouldn't have told me the story of three hearts. Is it so improbable? You know damn well the improbability is in your bending reality to fit it. I don't see what's so unreal in our finding each other. She shook her head and avoided my eyes. We spend the night together. Is that the idea? I'm just saying that when you discover the truth about Julie, if... But again she shook her head. Why do we have to wait that long? Because I know you don't believe me yet. I thought there'd be some snag. My tone had been growing more and more sarcastic, but now she looked me in the eyes. Hers had the exaggerated dilation of a dared child. 
If that's a challenge, I accept it. If it would make you believe me, the more I know you two, the more incredible you get. Because we both find you rather attractive, and I happen to feel sorry for you, as well as for myself, if that matters. I stared at her, half tempted to put her to the test, but it was so obvious that the real test was for me. Did Julie tell you I'd written to your mother? Yes. I had an answer a couple of days ago. I'm just wondering what she'd think if I wrote back and told her what her two daughters are really up to. She wouldn't think anything because she doesn't exist. You just happen to have someone in Serenabas who writes letters to you and forwards your mail? I've never been in Dorset in my life. My real name isn't Holmes, or June for that matter. I see. We're back on that one. Rose and Lily? I'm usually called Rosie, but yes. Balls. She contemplated me, then looked down. I can't remember the exact words, but our mythical mother's letter to you went something like this. Dear Mr. Orth, I've given your letter to Mr. Vuliami, who's head of the primary school here. Then there was something about pen pals in France and America being old hat, and how her two daughters don't write often enough. Yes? Now it was I who began to fall. As so often before, stable ground had turned in a few seconds to quicksand. She said, I'm sorry, but there's a thing called a universal postmarker. The letter was written here, an English stamp put on it. Then she made a little postmarking gesture. Now will you believe me? I was thinking back desperately. If they opened my outgoing letters, then... Do you open mail to me as well? I'm afraid so. Then you know about... About what? My Australian friend... She made a little movement of the shoulders. Of course she knew about her. But in some intuitive way I knew that she didn't. That I had her in a trap. Then tell me. Tell you what? What's happened? You've had an affair with her. And? She made another vague gesture. You've read all my mail, so you must know. Of course. Then you know that in fact I did meet her in Athens at half-term? She was caught. She didn't know which way she was being bluffed. She hesitated, then smiled back, but said nothing. I had left her mother's letter lying about on my desk. Demetriadis or anyone could have slipped in and read it. But Ann Taylor's letter and its contents I had hidden well away in a locked suitcase. We really do know everything, Nicholas. Then prove it. Did I or didn't I meet her in Athens? You know perfectly well you didn't. Before she could move, I gave her a slap across the cheeks. It was controlled, not hard, just enough to sting, but it shocked her. She put a slow hand to her cheek. Why did you do that? I'll do it a fucking sight harder if you don't start telling the truth. Is all my mail opened? She hesitated, still clasping her cheek, then conceded. Only what looks as if it might concern us. That's a pity. You should be more thorough. She said nothing. If you had opened it, you'd have known I did meet that poor bloody girl in Athens. I don't see what. Because of your sister. I asked her to kindly get it out of my life. June looked more frightened now, at a loss, not knowing what this was leading to. A couple of weeks later, she didn't get merely out of my life, but out of her own as well. She killed herself. I left a pause. Now you know the cost of your fun and fireworks at Barani. She stared. For a moment I thought she had believed me. But then she looked away. Please don't try to play Maurice's game. I caught her arms and shook her. I'm not playing games, you moronic little fool. She killed herself. She began to believe, yet still tried not to. But why didn't you tell us? I let go of her arms, because I felt bad about it. But people don't just kill themselves, because I think some people take life more seriously than any of you begin to imagine. There was a silence, then she spoke with a kind of naive timidity. She loved you? I hesitated, 
I tried to play fair, perhaps too fair. I'd have done it all by letter if you hadn't called that weekend off. Then it seemed mean not to tell her to her face that... I shrugged. You told her about Julie? I detected a true alarm in her voice. You're safe. Ashes can't blab. I didn't mean that. She glanced down. She took it badly? Not outwardly. If I'd realized... I was just trying to be honest, set her free from waiting for me. There was another silence, then she said in a low voice, If it's true, I can't think how you could have let us go on like this, because I was foolishly in love with your sister. But Maurice warned you. When did he ever tell me the truth? Again she was silent, calculating. She had changed now. I noticed the pretense that she had come over to my side was dropped. She looked me in the eyes. Nicholas, this is very important. You're not lying. I have proof in my room. Do you want to see it? Please. Her voice was tentative, apologetic now. Right. Be at the gate in two minutes. If you're not there, then forget it. You can all go to hell as far as I'm concerned. I turned and strode away before she could answer and resolutely refused to look back to see if she was following me. But as I unlocked the side gate into the school, there was lightning again, closer, a huge forked streak, and I glimpsed her slowly coming down the road a hundred yards away. Two minutes later, when I came back with Ann Taylor's letter and the press cuttings, I saw her at once, standing at the side of the road opposite the gates, Barbara Vasily stood in his lit doorway, but I ignored him. She came to meet me, took the envelope I silently thrust at her. Her nervousness was unconcealed now. She even dropped the letter as she took it out of the envelope and had to stoop to retrieve it. Then she turned to catch the light from the lodge and began to read. She finished Ann Taylor's covering letter, but remained staring at it a moment then lifted the page and looked briefly at the newspaper cuttings. Suddenly her eyes closed, and she bent her head, almost as if she were praying. Then she very slowly folded the papers back together, put them inside the envelope, and passed it back to me. Her head stayed bowed. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to say. That makes a welcome change. We honestly didn't know. Well... Now you do. You should have told us. And have Maurice inform me it's all part of the comedy of life? She looked up quickly, stung. If you knew, that honestly isn't fair, Nicholas. If I knew? She contemplated me gravely, then looked down. I really don't know what to say. It must have been wrong tense. Yes, I can. Then she said, I'm so sorry. You're not the most to blame. She shook her head. That's the thing. In a way, I am. But she did not explain why. For a few moments, we stood there like two strangers at a graveside. There was lightning again, and it seemed to force her to a decision. She gave me the ghost of a sympathetic smile, touched my sleeve. Just wait here a moment. She turned and walked through the side gate up the path toward Barba Vasily who had been idly watching us from his doorway. Barbara Vasily? Then I heard her speak Greek rapidly, far more fluently than myself. After the first words, it was in too low a voice for me to follow. I saw the old man bow his head once, then twice more, accepting some instruction. Then June came back through the gate and stopped six feet from me, gave me a wry, confessing look. Come on. Come on where? To the house. Julie's there, waiting. Then why the hell? It doesn't matter now. Her eyes flicked toward the approaching rain clouds. Match abandoned. You seem to have learnt Greek very fast. Because I've spent three summers here. She smiled, but gently, to appease my lost, angry face, then came abruptly and caught my arms, so that I had to look at her. I want you to forget every single thing I've said this evening. My name is June Holmes. She is Julie. 
We do have a doughty mother, though not in Serenabas. I still wouldn't surrender. She said, she does write like that, but we made up the letter. And Joe? Julie likes him. There was a transient dryness in her eyes, but I can assure you she doesn't go to bed with him. She seemed almost impatient now, at a loss how to convince and mollify me. She raised her hands in a prayer gesture. Nicholas, please, please trust me, just for a few minutes till we get there. I swear to God we didn't know about your friend. Then we'd have stopped tormenting you at once if we had. You must believe that. There was a force, a convincingness about her now, a different girl, a different nature. If one minute with Julie doesn't make you realize you have nothing to be jealous about, you may drown me in the nearest cistern. Still, I refused to budge. What have you just told him in there? We have a kind of emergency code word. Stop the experiment. Experiment? Yes. Is the old man here? At Burani. The message will be radioed to him. Behind her, Barba Vasily had been locking the side gate. I saw him set off up the path to the master's block. June glanced around after my own look, then took my hand and pulled it. Come on. I still wavered, but a coaxing determination in her won. I was drawn into walking beside her, a hand caught in hers like a prisoner. What experiment? She pressed my hand, but said nothing for a few steps. Maurice will go mad. Why? Because what your friend did is what he's devoted most of his life to trying to prevent. Who is he? She hesitated, then abandoned secrecy. Very nearly what he told you he was, at one stage, with one last encouraging pressure, she let go of my hand. He's the French equivalent of an emeritus professor of psychiatry. Until a year or two ago, he was a pillar of the Sorbonne Medical School. She gave me a quick side glance. And I wasn't at Cambridge. I read psychology at London University. Then I went to Paris to do postgraduate work under Maurice. So did Joe from America. And several of the others here you haven't met yet. She said, which reminds me. You must have got so many false impressions, but one thing, you must forgive Joe for what he did that evening. He's really a very intelligent and gentle person. I looked at her. Something in her face was shy, and she gave a little confirmatory shrug. Julie isn't the one of us he might feel masculine about. I'm lost. Don't worry. You'll understand very soon. There's one other thing. Julie wasn't lying when she told you it was her first summer here. It is. In a way, she's even been a fellow victim. Yet knowing what was going on? Yes, but also having to find her way through the maze. We've all been through it in the past. Joe, me, everyone else. We do know what it's like. The being lost, the rejection, the anger, and we all know it's finally worth it. There were great skittering sheets of lightning behind us, almost continuous. Islands to the east, ten, fifteen miles away, stood palely out, then vanished. The smell of rain was heavy in the air, little scurries of precursory wind. We were walking fast through the village. Somewhere a shutter slammed, but there seemed no one about. An experiment in what? Unexpectedly she stopped, made me turn and face her. Nicholas, first, you've been our most interesting subject yet. Second, all your secret reactions, feelings, guesses, all the things you haven't even told Julie are vitally important to us. We have hundreds of questions to ask you, but we don't want to spoil their validity by giving you all the explanations beforehand. I'm asking you to be patient for just a day or two more. Her eyes were very direct, so direct, I looked down from them. I've got very short on patience. I know it must seem to be asking a lot, but we would be so grateful. I gave no sign of acceptance, but I did not argue any more. We began walking again. She must have sensed my recalcitrance. After a few steps, she threw me a sop. I'll give you one clue. 
Maurice's lifelong special field has been the nature of the delusional symptoms of insanity. She put her hands in her pockets. Psychiatry is getting more and more interested in the other side of the coin, why sane people are sane, why they won't accept delusions and fantasies as real. Obviously, it's very difficult to explore that if you tell your sane guinea pig, your very sane guinea pig in this case, that everything he's going to be told is an attempt to delude him. I said nothing, and she went on. You must be thinking we're running a very delicate tightrope in medical ethics. We are aware of that. But our justification is that one day the same temporary victims like you may, be, may have helped some very sick people, perhaps far more than you can imagine. I let a few steps pass in silence. What was the delusion planned for tonight? That I was your last true friend, she added quickly, which wasn't all a lie, the friend part, anyway. I wasn't going to buy it. You weren't really expected to, she gave me another quick smile. If you can imagine playing chess, but not to win, merely to see what moves the other person makes. All that Lillian Rose nonsense. The names are a kind of joke. There's a card in the tarot pack called the Magus, the Magician, Conjurer. Two of his traditional symbols are the Lily and the Rose. We came past the hotel into the little square round the main harbor. The lightning made its shuttered facades spring luridly to life like a stage set, and what she was beginning to tell me, that too was like the lightning, flashes of seeing all, darkness of still doubting it. But as with the real lightning, illumination began to overcome night. Why is it Julie's first year? Her emotional life's been... I gather she told you. She was at Cambridge? Yes, her affair with Andrew really was a disaster. I knew she hadn't got over it. I thought this might help her. And Maurice was attracted by the possibilities that twin sisters afforded. That was another reason. I was meant to fall for her? She hesitated. Nothing in the course of our experiments is meant in that sense. You can force people to do many things, but not feel sexual attraction, or the opposite. She looked down at the cobbles. It's improvised, Nicholas, not planned. If you like, the rat is given a kind of parity with the experimenter. It also can dictate the walls of the maze, as you have, perhaps without fully realizing it. A few steps passed, then she said in a lighter voice, I'll tell you one other secret. Julie wasn't at all happy about Sunday, the kidnapping. In fact, we weren't at all sure she would do it, till she did. I thought back, and remembered Julie's marked reluctance to show me that wretched subterranean hiding place before our picnic, and what had followed it, and even then I had almost forced it on her. Do I have any sisterly approval in real life? You should have met her last answer to every maiden's prayer. She added quickly, I'm being catty. Andrew was very clever, sensitive, but a bisexual. They do have awful problems. She needs someone. I saw her mouth curve. My strictly clinical opinion is that she's found him. We climbed an uphill alley toward the square of the execution. All the old man has told me about his past is that all the invention... We're very anxious to hear your guesses and conclusions first. But you know the truth? She hesitated. I think I know most of the truth. I know what Maurice has let us know. I pointed at the wall where the plaque commemorating the execution stood. And about that? Ask anyone in the village. I know he was here, but did it happen as he said? She was silent a moment. Why do you think it didn't? All that vision of the pure essence of freedom was very fine, but eighty lives seems rather a high price for it, and hardly to tie in with the hatred of suicide you claim he has. Then perhaps he made a terrible error of judgment? That set me back a moment. That's what I felt. Did you tell him so? Not in so many words. 
I saw her smile. Then perhaps that was your error of judgment. She went on before I could answer. When I was once what you are now, he spent an evening destroying every belief I had in my own intelligence, every pride I had in my work, all in circumstances where I had to believe him. In the end, I broke down. I just kept saying, it isn't true. It isn't true. I'm not like that. Then I looked up, and he was smiling. He just said, at last. I wish he didn't seem to get such genuine sadistic enjoyment out of doing it. But that's precisely why one believes him. Or he would say precisely why one doesn't stand up against the real thing. She glanced dryly at me. The apparently sadistic conspiracy against the individual we call evolution, existence, history, I realized that was what the metatheater was about. He used to give a famous lecture on art as institutionalized illusion, she grimaced. Our secret horror we always have is that someone like you will have read it. It's one reason we could never do this to a young French intellectual. He is French? No, Greek. But he was born in Alexandria, mostly brought up in France. His father was very rich, cosmopolitan, at least I imagine. Maurice seems to have rebelled against the life he was supposed to lead. He claims he first went to England to escape from his parents to study medicine. And obviously you admire him a lot. She gave a little nod as she walked, then said quietly, I think he's the greatest teacher in the world. I don't even think. I know. How did it go last year? Oh, God, that dreadful man. We had to find another subject, not from the school. Someone in Athens. And Le Verrier? She had a smile, unmistakably of affectionate memory. John. And she touched my arm. That's a very different story. Tomorrow? Now it's your turn. Tell me a bit about... You know. So I told her a little about Allison. I hadn't misled her in any way. In Athens, of course. I simply had realized how much she had been hiding. There was no previous record of suicide attempts? Absolutely none. She always seemed someone who could take things as they came. No depressive? No. It does happen. With women, out of the blue. The tragedy is they often don't really mean it. I'm afraid she did. It was probably always latent. Though there are usually signs, she said, and usually there's a better reason for it than just breaking off a relationship. I've tried to feel that. At least it's not as if you lied to her in any way. She pressed my hand briefly. You mustn't blame yourself. We had come to the house and in high time, because the first sporadic but heavy drops of rain were beginning to splash down. The storm seemed to be heading straight for the island. June pushed the outer gate open, and I followed her up the path. She took a key and unlocked the front door. The hall was lit, though the current kept wavering under the much greater currents of electricity being discharged in the sky. There she turned and kissed my cheek quickly, almost shyly. Wait here. She may be asleep. I won't be a second. I watched her run up the stairs and disappear. There was a tap, and she called Julie's name in a low voice. A door opened and closed, then silence. The thunder and lightning outside, an abrupt squall of more consistent rain on the window panes, a gust of cool air from somewhere. Two minutes passed. Then the invisible door upstairs opened. Julie came first, barefooted in a black kimono over a white nightdress. She paused a moment, a distressed face, staring down at me. Then she came running down the stairs. Oh, Nicholas, she fell into my arms. We didn't kiss. June stayed at the top, smiling down. Julie held me away from her, searching my eyes. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know. She sank against me again as if she was the one who needed comforting. I patted her back. June blew a light kiss, a venison, down at me from the top of the stairs, then disappeared. June's told you? 
Yes. Everything? Some of it. She held me a little closer still. I'm so relieved it's all over. I haven't forgiven you for Sunday. She looked up with a good deal more seriousness in her face than there had been in my voice, beseeched me to believe her. I hated it, Nicholas. I nearly didn't do it. Honestly, it was so terrible knowing it was going to happen. You hid it disgustingly well, only because I knew it was all nearly over. I hear it's your first year as well, and my last. I wouldn't do it again, especially now. Again she appealed for understanding, forgiveness. June's always been so mysterious about it. I had to see what it was like. I'm glad, finally. She came close against me again. I haven't lied about one thing. I wonder what that is. My hand was found, gently pinched in reproach. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Anyway, you can't go back to your school in this rain, she added, and I hate being alone in thunder and lightning. So do I, now you mention it. Our next lines were not spoken, and once they were exchanged, she took my hand and led me upstairs. We came to the door of the room I had searched three days before. But there she hesitated, then gave me a faintly self-mocking, yet genuinely shy look. What I said on Sunday? You long ago made me forget every other girl I've... She looked down. This is where my witchcraft stops. I always liked us better as Ferdinand and Miranda. She smiled a moment as if she had forgotten that, gave me an intense look, seemed about to say something else, changed her mind. She opened the door and we went in. There was a lamp on by the bed. The shutters were closed. The bed was as she had left it, the sheet and a folk weave bedspread thrown aside, the pillow crumpled. Some open book of poetry beneath the lamp. I could see its broken lines of print, an abalone shell used as an ashtray. We stood a little at a loss, as people do when they have foreseen such moments too long. Her hair was down, the white hem of her nightdress reached almost to her ankles. She glanced round the room as if with my eyes, as if I might be contemptuous of such domestic simplicity, made a little grimace. I smiled. But her shyness was contagious, and the changed reality between us, what she had really meant by no more witchcraft, no more games, evasions, tantalizings. For a bizarre few seconds those seemed, in retrospect, to hold a paradoxical innocence, Adam and Eve before the fall. Mercifully, the world outside came to our aid. There was a flash of lightning, the lamp shuddered, then went out. We were plunged into pitch darkness. Almost at once there was a tremendous peal of thunder overhead. Before it had died away, she was in my arms and we were kissing hungrily. More lightning, even louder and closer thunder. She twisted against me, clinging like a child. I kissed the crown of her head, patted her back, murmured, Shall I undress you and put you to bed and hold you? Let me sit on your lap a minute. It makes me so nervous. I was led in the darkness to a chair opposite the bed, against the wall. I sat, she sat across my knees, and we kissed again. Then she nestled against me, found my free hand, and laced her fingers through mine. Tell me about your friend. What really happened? I told her what I had told her sister a few minutes before. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing. I felt so fed up with Maurice. With you, I couldn't face just hanging around here. Did you tell her about me? Only that I'd met someone on the island. Was she upset? That's the absurd thing. That's the absurd thing. If only she had been, hadn't buried it all so well. Her hand squeezed mine gently. And you didn't want her at all? I felt sorry for her, but she really didn't seem too surprised. Not answering my question, I smiled in the darkness as this not very well concealed battle between sympathy and feminine curiosity. I kept thinking how much rather I'd be with you. Poor girl, at least I can imagine how she must have felt. She wasn't like you, 
She never took anything seriously, especially if it was male. But she must have taken you seriously, in the end. I had anticipated that. I think I was just a kind of symbol, Julie, of all sorts of other things that had gone wrong in her life. The last straw, I suppose. What did you do in Athens? A few sights, had a meal, sat and talked, drank too much. It was all very civilized, really, or seemed it. Her nails dug gently into the back of my hand. I bet you did go to bed. Would you be angry if we had? Her head shook against mine. No, I deserved it. I'd understand. She raised my hand and kissed it. I wish you'd tell me. Why are you so curious? Because there's so much I don't know about you. I took a breath. Perhaps I should have. Then at least she might still be alive. There was a little silence. Then she kissed my cheek. I'm only trying to find out if I'm spending the night with a callous swine or a bruised angel. There's only one way to find that out. You think? Another light kiss, then she slipped gently free of my arm and moved away a little beside the bed. It was very dark in the room and I could see nothing, but then lightning shivered through the shutters. For a brief flash I saw her by the cassone, peeling her nightdress over her head. Then it was sound, her feeling her way back toward me. A crack of thunder, a little shocked out breath. I reached and found her groping hand and pulled her back naked to my lap. Our mouths met and I explored her body, the breasts, the smooth stomach, the little thatch of hair, the thighs. I could have used a dozen hands, not one, to have her surrendered at last, compliant, mine. She shifted, stood a moment, then straddled my lap and began to unbutton my shirt. In another flash of lightning, I glimpsed the expression on her face, a kind of intense seriousness, like a child undressing a doll. She forced the shirt and the jacket I was still wearing back away from my body. Then she clasped her hands behind my neck, as she had in the sea at Moza, and sat away a little. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. You can't see me. Felt. I bent and kissed her breasts, then pulled her against me and found her mouth again. She was wearing some strange scent, musky and faintly orange, like cowslips, and it seemed to batch something both sensual and innocent in her, a growing abandon to passion that was also a willed attempt to be what she felt I must want, feverish, strained, not playful at all. In the end, she tore her mouth away as if she was exhausted. After a few moments, she whispered, Let's open the shutters. I love the smell of the rain. She slipped away and went to open them. I got quickly out of my remaining clothes and caught her as she turned back from the window, made her turn, held her close from behind so that we stood with the rain teeming down three feet away, the cool wall of dark air. All the lights in the village were out. The generator fuse must have blown. Lightning split the sky over toward the mainland, and for a moment or two, the crowded houses below us, all the walls and the roofs, even the sea below, were illuminated with an uncanny pale violet light. But the thunder took longer to arrive. The short center of the storm had already passed on. Julie leaned back against me, abandoning the front of her body to the night and my encircling hands. I smoothed down the little belly, ruffled the pubic hair. Her head turned against me, then she raised her right leg and rested it on a stool below the window, so that the hand could caress more easily. She took my other hand, led it to her breasts, then stood absolutely passive, letting me excite her, as if the rain was her real lover and the outside night as if I was now to do to her what she had done to me in the sea. Little splashes of the downpour bounced from the sill against my lower hand and her skin, but she seemed oblivious of them. I whispered, I whispered, I wish we could go outside. Her mouth twisted to kiss me in quick assent, but then her hands found mine again and pressed to keep them where they were. She preferred this now to be gently abused, 
slowly coaxed. It was still lightning, but it began to seem from another world. The only real world was her body and my own. The curves of her back, the warmth there, the pods of silken skin with their aroused tips, the indulged, solicited caress below. It was a little as I had imagined in the beginning. The Lily Montgomery phase, this delicate, elusive creature, half swooning, succumbed to the animal part of herself, and not quite adult yet, beneath her airs and graces, something of the innocent perversity of a little girl playing at sex with little boys. Suddenly, half a minute later, she caught my hands and made them lie on her stomach, imprisoned them. What's wrong? You're being wicked. That was the idea. She turned against me, her face buried. Tell me what you liked her doing to you best. I remembered an old urf law that girls possess sexual tact in inverse proportions to their standard of education, but I saw some delicious but I saw some delicious instruction ahead in this case. Why do you want to know? Because I want to do it to you. I held her a little closer. I like you as you are. She whispered, You're so big. Her hands stole down between us. We stood apart a little. There seemed something virginal about her, yet wanting to be corrupted, led further. She whispered again, Have you got a thing in my coat? Shall I put it on for you? I went and found the contraceptive, and Julie moved beside the bed. There was a little more light now. The clouds must have thinned slightly. I could just see her silhouette. She took the sheath, made me sit on the end of the bed, knelt on the island rug, leaned forward and rolled the sheath on, bent, and gave it a little kiss, then sat back on her heels, hands folded across her loins, demure. I could just see her smile. Liar, I don't think you're shy at all. I did spend five years in a convent dormitory where nothing was left to the imagination. The rain was easing, but the freshness of it, the smell of cistern water on stone, pervaded the room. I saw it secretly streaming down, the walls of hundreds of cisterns, the excited eels at the bottom. All that talk of running away. Her smile deepened, but she said nothing. I reached for her, and she rose, let herself be drawn down on top of me. Silence, then, a retreat from everything but the conversation of bodies. She pretended to possess me, mocked and consoled me with her mouth, then a silence even of movement, as if in time she would melt down into me, but that began to seem a waiting in her. I broke the spell and she shifted, lay back on the rough bedspread, her head on the pillow. I knelt and kissed down her body to the ankles, surveyed her a moment from the bottom of the bed. She lay a little twisted to one side, an arm flung out, her head sideways. But as I moved forward, she turned fully on her back. A few moments later, I was deep inside her. It was not like any other such moment of first entry I had ever gained. Something well beyond the sexual. There was such a fraught, frustrated past, such a future inherent in it, such a possession I knew I had won far more than her body. I lay suspended on my arms over her. She was staring up in the darkness. I said, I adore you. I want you to. Always? Always. I began to thrust slowly, but then something strange happened. Without warning, the lamp beside the bed came on again. They must have mended the generator down in the village. I stopped my movement for a second or two. We were comically like two shocked strangers, our eyes locked in embarrassment, so much so that we had to smile. I looked down her slim body to where we were joined, then back to her face. I sensed something troubled and shy in her look, but then she closed her eyes and let her head fall sideways in profile. If I wanted it, so... I began to drive, her arms bent back behind her head, as if she was defenseless, doubly naked, completely at my mercy, that lovely slave-like limpness in everything but the loins. 
There was a tiny rhythmic creaking somewhere in the bed frame. She seemed so small, fragile, asking for the brutality she had said she had felt in the chapel at Moza. Her hands clenched, as if I was really hurting her. I came, it was too soon, but irresistible. I thought it was much too soon for her, but just as I was dying, about to give up, she suddenly raised her arms and urged me on, a brief but convulsive little thrusting against me. Then I pulled violently down to meet her mouth. We lay still, joined for a little time, in the profound silence of the house. Then we were separate, and I moved beside her. She reached out for the lamp switch, and we were in darkness again. She turned on her stomach, her face turned away. I stroked down her back, patted the small bottom, kept caressing its curves. Already, despite the traditional nature of the moment, I felt a marvelous surge of euphoria. I hadn't expected it to be so shared, so full of promise, like the skin beneath my hand, that she could be so warm, capable of giving. I told myself I ought to have guessed. There was that feeling about June of a girl who enjoyed it. And the same need must have lain buried in the less extrovert sister beside me. At last our bodies had expressed themselves, and I knew it would be much better still, subtler, longer, infinite variations, that appled bottom, the tangled hair against my mouth, a distant receding roll of thunder. Already outside there was more light. The moon must have broken partially from behind the clouds. All storms were past, and we lay in the silence of Eden regained. It was some five minutes later. We had lain in total silence. No words were needed. But then she pushed herself up, leant over me for a moment, stooped and quickly kissed me. She leant back, and her face above mine, in a hanging cloud of hair, a faint smile, her eyes on mine. Nicholas, will you always remember something about tonight? I grinned. What? That it's also how, not why. Still I smiled. How was beautiful, as I wanted it to be. For the briefest moment she hesitated, almost as if it were some formula she expected me to repeat. Then suddenly she knelt back, turned and was off the bed, and reaching for her kimono. I should have reacted more quickly, at least to the briskness with which she reached for the garment, if not to something in her voice and face when she was looking down at me, a seriousness that had nothing to do with the naivete I first took it for. I leant up on an elbow. Where are you going? She didn't answer for a moment, then turned, tying the kimono sash, and looked down at me. I think there was still a trace of a smile on her face. To the trial. The what? It all happened so impossibly fast. She was already moving away before I had fully registered the change in her voice, its now patent lack of innocence. Julie? She turned at the door, left the tiny pause of the actress before her exit line. My name isn't Julie, Nichols, and I'm sorry we can't provide the customary flames. This time I sat fully up. Flames? What flames? But before I could speak, she had pulled the door open and stepped aside. Light flooded in. There was a violent cascade of figures. <laughs>